Okay, let's dive into something really uh, quite surprising today. Imagine unlocking a genetic time capsule hidden deep within the DNA of, well, an entire nation, Poland. It sounds like science fiction almost. Right. And what if I told you this isn't just some fascinating historical side note, but it's a living record, a record of centuries of survival against invasions, horrific genocides, borders constantly shifting. It's an incredible backdrop. And this genetic makeup, it isn't just unique. It's arguably one of Europe's most complex uh, and politically charged gene pools and profoundly insightful, too. Yeah, politically charged is definitely part of it. And that's why we're seeing this increased focus, isn't it? It is. The idea of what some people are calling the Poland gene, it has scientists, historians, medical experts all paying closer attention. So our mission for this deep dive is to really explore why. Why are Poland's genetics so significant? What can they teach us? Exactly. We want to invite you, our listener, to join us on this journey. Let's uncover the insights, the real-world implications of this well, amazing genetic story. Think of this as your shortcut, maybe, to understanding a really compelling piece of European history and biology. A shortcut through a very complex landscape. Definitely. So, let's get started. When you look at a map, Poland is right there. Geographic center of Europe, more or less. Smack dab in the middle. But its location, it's not just about where it is on the map. Historically, it's been this constant crossroads. Right. A hub for conflict, definitely, but also for migration, for oh. cultural fusion. It's uh, like a central station for human history in Europe. That's a great way to put it, Grand Central Station. Which is precisely why modern Polish DNA isn't just one single thing. It's not uniform. Mm -hmm. If we connect this to the bigger picture, research shows it's this remarkable blend. The blend of what, specifically? Well, you have the foundational West Slavic ancestry, that's mm -hmm. key, but also significant Nordic think Viking influence. Viking? Really? Whereabouts? Yeah, particularly noticeable in the northern regions. Then, before World War II, you had substantial Ashkenazi... Jewish lineages, a huge presence. And of course, Germanic and Baltic elements too, uh, all woven in from centuries of, you know, shifting borders and people moving. It's not just a mix. It sounds more like uh, what you called it earlier, a literal genetic time capsule. That's exactly the term some researchers use. It's kind of mind blowing. Inside individual cells, you're seeing the survival stories of empires, kingdoms, diasporas, all etched in the DNA. It really is quite profound when you think about it that way, which naturally leads to the question, what does the actual data say? Right. Let's get into the numbers. OK, so there was a population genetics study, University of Warsaw, back in 2018, pretty recent. It revealed something striking. Over 92% of ethnic Poles share the Slavic Y-DNA haplogroup R1A. 92%? That's huge. It is. And R1A is described as one of the most ancient and widespread male lineages across Eurasia. So it speaks to deep, deep roots. That 92% for R1A, that's really striking. That makes me wonder, though, what else does the data show? How do Poles compare genetically to their neighbors? That's another really interesting layer. Uh, Genome-wide comparisons show the Poles are genetically closer to Ukrainians and Czechs. Closer to them than to Russians or Germans. Yes, exactly. Which is notable, right? Considering the long, often very complicated history Poland has had with both Russia and Germany. Yeah, that is surprising. It really highlights how um, genetic closeness doesn't always map neatly onto political history or borders. Precisely. Cultural and political ties are one thing. Deep genetic ancestry is another. Okay, so that's the historical ancestry side. What about the medical implications? Is there anything in the Polish gene pool that particularly stands out for researchers? This is where it's really compelling from a medical perspective. Poland has one of the highest frequencies in Europe of a specific gene mutation called F508. F508, what's that linked to? It's directly related to cystic fibrosis. Ah. And that high frequency, it's prompted huge interest from geneticists. It's driving a lot of disease-specific research focused on that population. So Polish DNA might look, I don't know, ordinary on the surface. Maybe at first glance. But it actually contains these unique patterns in gene variants. Mm -hmm. Scientists call them allelic frequencies, mm -hmm. and also specific mutation clusters. Mutation clusters, like groups of genetic changes specific to the population. Exactly. Distinct groupings. And these unique patterns, they have major implications, not just for understanding evolutionary history, but for modern medicine, too. That idea of genetic uniqueness, it leads us into a really difficult... Um, a very tragic chapter. Yes, inevitably. World War II. Before the war, Poland was home to this huge Jewish population. Over three million people. One of the largest Jewish communities in the world at the time. 
And the Nazi genocide, the Holocaust, it didn't just kill millions. It fundamentally ruptured the genetic landscape, didn't it? Absolutely. It was a catastrophic disruption of genetic continuity. The estimates today, well, they're did, staggering. What do they suggest? Estimates suggest that over 40 percent, maybe even more, of today's global Ashkenazi Jewish gene pool can trace roots back to communities that once thrived in Poland. 40 percent. That's incredible. And the trauma didn't end with the Holocaust, right? What about after the war? No, it didn't. Post-war, you had forced border shifts. Yeah. Events like Operation Vistula forcibly displaced entire ethnic groups. Who was affected by that? Ukrainians, Belarusians, Lemkos. People were moved, borders were redrawn. This effectively erased or redistributed genetic patterns that had been relatively stable for centuries. So these huge traumatic events, genocide, forced migration, they leave a physical genetic mark, not just historical or cultural. Yes. Geneticists have a term for what can happen in these situations. Founder effects. Founder effects. How does that work? Basically, if a population is drastically reduced or if a small group migrates and founds a new community, the survivors or founders carry only a fraction of the original genetic diversity. So less variety going forward. Exactly. <laughs> now, this can sometimes, unfortunately, lead to higher rates of certain inherited diseases within that new smaller group. Because rare mutations might become more common by chance. Precisely. Yeah. But it also creates these unique traceable lineages. It's a stark story, really. Yeah. Survival through selection, through trauma, and through time. Survival through selection, trauma, and time, that really captures it. It makes you think about resilience, doesn't it? Deeply. And that connects to cultural perceptions. Polish people are often seen as, well, incredibly resilient, hardworking, intelligent. There's definitely that perception, that stereotype almost. Is there any scientific basis? I mean, obviously not a single gene for resilience, but... Right. Scientists would definitely say no, there's no single gene for complex traits like that. Right. It's far more complicated. However, it is fascinating to think about how certain cultural traits like resilience might have co-evolved perhaps with genetic tendencies. Tendencies related to... Maybe things like adapting to a cold climate, endurance, Efficient metabolism, traits potentially favored by the historical and environmental conditions. Okay, that makes sense. Coevolution. And then there's this other layer, which is uh, admittedly controversial, but also really intriguing. Yeah. Epigenetic inheritance. Epigenetic inheritance. Okay, that sounds complex. Break that down for us. The basic idea is that experiences, particularly traumatic ones, might leave a mark not on the DNA sequence itself, the actual code doesn't change, but on how those genes are expressed. How they're switched on or off. Basically. Exactly. How the existing genetic code is read and used by the body. The theory is that memories of trauma, maybe generational trauma from war, starvation, forced migration, mm -hmm. can be encoded in these gene expression patterns. So it's not changing the letters of the DNA book, but maybe adding sticky notes or highlights that change how you read it. That's actually a pretty good analogy, yes. It's about the instructions for how the code behaves. Wow. And this idea has sparked debates? Oh, absolutely. Global debates. And particularly resonant in Poland, given its history. It raises questions about national identity. Does it have roots not just in language or borders, but maybe in this kind of cellular memory? Cellular memory, that's a powerful concept. It is. And it brings us neatly back to the present day because this unique genetic story, this history, it makes Poland a really critical frontier for medical research now. How so? What makes it a focal point? It's that combination of relative genetic homogeneity within the ethnic Polish population alongside those well-documented historical bottlenecks we talked about, the founder effects. So that specific combination is useful for researchers. Very useful, especially for studying rare diseases. Okay, so building on that, what specific diseases or conditions are scientists focusing on in Poland? Well, cystic fibrosis, obviously given the F508 mutation frequency we mentioned. Right. Also, familial hypercholesterolemia, that's high cholesterol running in families. And within the Ashkenazi communities with Polish roots, diseases like Tay-Sachs and neiman pick are still areas of active study. And this research isn't just academic. Not at all. Biotech companies, university labs, they're actively using Polish genome data, not just to understand the past, but to build better diagnostic tools for today. They're tracing genetic lineages more precisely and developing what we call precision treatments therapies tailored specifically for Eastern European populations based on their genetic makeup. That seems incredibly promising. Personalized medicine based on ancestry. It holds huge potential. But as you can imagine, it brings up ethical questions. Yeah, absolutely. Big ones. Mm -hmm. Who owns this genetic data? 
How do we ensure it's used responsibly and equitably? Crucial questions. There needs to be oversight. Constant vigilance and ethical frameworks are essential. So after exploring all this, the geography, the history, the data, the tragedy, the medical potential, let's circle back to that initial idea. The big question, is the Poland gene real or is it just, you know, a catchy label? Well, to answer directly, no, there isn't one specific single Poland gene. That's an oversimplification. But what there absolutely is, is a distinct and I think incredibly resilient genetic fingerprint. A fingerprint. I like that. Yes. A fingerprint that's been profoundly shaped by everything we've discussed. Geography, war, peace, famine, survival, faith, all of it. It's not about purity. That's the key thing. It's about complexity. It's not about purity. It's about complexity. That's a perfect summary. And just to quickly recap some of those really striking data points for everyone listening, remember, over 92% of ethnic Poles carry that Slavic haplogroup R1A, deep historical roots. A powerful marker of that Slavic core. Poland also has one of the highest rates of that cystic fibrosis mutation, AFA508, in Europe, making it key for medical research. A major focus for genetic medicine. And historically, before World War II, Poland was home to around 40% of the world's Ashkenazi ancestry, a central place in Jewish genetic history. A huge historical significance. So as we wrap up, maybe a final thought for you, our listener. We invite you to consider, does your own family have roots in Poland or maybe Central Europe more broadly? Do you think history leaves these kinds of marks on our genes in ways we're maybe only just starting to truly understand? Have you ever explored your own ancestry? through records, or maybe even DNA testing? And did you find something surprising, something that maybe the raw data, the percentages from a testing kit just couldn't fully capture? Something the full story goes beyond, food for thought.